Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started, but we'll just cover some of the technical stuff while people have a, a moment to settle in. Um, this is before leveraging a relationship-centered focus in school communities, and you are in for a treat um, with our guest invited speakers today, um, Jessica and Rachel from Roanoke County Public Schools in Virginia. Um, Jessica, I let her introduce herself, but I'm also I super excited that Rachel, a student, is with us, and she just knocks my socks off every time I hear her speak. And Tina Turner, I love saying that out loud, that I know Tina Turner, is also here, and she is going to be our content facilitator. She's also from Roanoke County, and I see Amy I, twice in one day. I'm so thrilled, Amy. <laughs> I'm going to be your tech. I'm going to be your techie. Oh, well, we are in good hands. All right. So just looking, these are just some standard slides, but just as a reminder, um, if you want to use the chat, that would be done on the Pathable platform where you see chat and Tina will help us manage that because we can't see it when we're sharing our screen, but um, she will let us know if a pertinent question comes up, we'll have some intentional pauses for questions and then we'll allow time at the end for questions as well. All right, and again, if you get, uh, if you accidentally push a button and find yourself <laughs> um, lost, try to use um, the help features and so forth in um, Pathable to try to stay in this platform. So we're gonna get started. This was the description that um, Dr. McClung and I worked on diligently to try to capture the essence of what they do in Roanoke County. Virginia. And it's really about looking at, you know, this emotional distress, especially now, it's it's part of everyone's life, um, maybe elevated um, now. But we know that the relationships are such a critical component, a protective factor for us in terms of our resiliency. Um, and so we want to look at just, I'm going to set this up a little bit by unpacking some things around relationships, like skill sets and other concepts, like what does that look like and sound like? And then I just, I can't wait for you to hear um, from Roanoke County on the work that they've done through their stories and experiences um, to really bring this to life. And so relationships are a protective factor for all of us. When you look at resiliency, connection is one of those kind of factors, if you will, in resiliency. And so by connecting with one another through healthy relationships, that is enhancing all of our well being, our collective well being. And so we want to think about okay, so we throw this word relationship building around um, in education. And what does that actually mean? Do we all come to the table with the same ability to build relationship skills? What, how are we more intentional with those skill sets? And really thinking about what I love about PBIS um, in particular is that it, it, it asks us and invites us to create this platform where our school community personnel are seen and heard. So this is really looking at those intent, more intentionality around relationships. We've probably all seen John Hattie's work. Um, we know that there's a strong predictive relationship in terms of teacher-student relationships and student learning. Um, think about the charge we're all faced with right now around accelerated student learning um, and thinking about how we're pausing to intentionally build fluency with relationship building across our school community. So there are some research that you can look at, and we won't spend too much time, but I'll say to you, the second bullet and the last bullet to me are just critical right now. And I love the emerging research that's showing us some relationship between when we have strong teacher-student relationships, there is an impact on teacher well-being. So I, that's something for us to keep our eye on. And I love the last bullet around a great predictor, a strong predictor protector of teacher joy versus anxiety. And so there's some other things, points there that you can look at, but I want to keep us moving. And that is when we work um, with Roanoke County Public Schools, we talked about, and it was right, I think the summer, um, Jessica, 
like COVID hit and then summer came and we said, okay, what are we doing? How are we using the framework to address the needs that are going on? And we had this beautiful conversation with leadership about, well, what is relationship? What are those skill sets? And so we started to unpack relationship building skills. And not that these are the only skill sets, but these are some that we pull from Brene Brown, who's that qualitative researcher out of Texas, who I just think has extraordinary research to start to unpack, well, what does that mean? intentional relationship building. And so you can look at some placeholders here around connection. How do we build connection? How do we ensure that every student is connected to our schools? What about belonging? How do we create a culture of belonging? What does communication look like that fosters relationship building? And I'm gonna say love. How are we cultivating love in the culture of our schools um, and empathy? And I think Tim Lewis, I was in a meeting with him or something, and he made a comment that I just wanted to ring the bell for. And that was, aside from or beside self-compassion, empathy is one of those skill sets that I think we could all use um, some support around, that we could all use a space where receiving and giving empathy. So we started to think about well, what do these words mean to you and why does paying attention to these words matter? And we had school teams engage with these words. We unpacked them. I'm going to show you just a couple of snippets of that. But the, co the comments and the outcomes of that time with the school teams, it was just phenomenal. Um, I was so impressed and I learned so much um, from what they were bringing forth. So just a couple of quick things to think about. And maybe write some notes to yourself because when you listen to Jessica and Rachel share their stories and experiences, I'm gonna invite you to think about some of these skill sets for intentional relationship building, connection, belonging, love, um, communication, empathy. And so we know that as humans, we are all hardwired for connection. And you're gonna hear stories that extend beyond just the walls of the building, the school building, but they extend across schools. They extend into communities. Um, and I want you to listen for the connection um, that um, these stories reflect. And so we know that our relationships and our experiences, it's not just our social emotional well being, it is actually our physiology, our biology that these impact. And so I always want to know why, why relationships, and I've heard it, as you probably have too, that they matter, but I want to know why they matter. What is the impact of healthy relationships? And so if we continue to unpack a little bit of this, just so that we can have something to look for and listen for in these stories, um, when we unpack connection, it is really one of the most important aspects of relationships in our school. How connected people feel to one another. It matters. And if you look at the definition that evolved from Brene Brown's research, it's this energy, if you will. And here's what I, I love that she can operationally define. It exists when people um, feel seen, heard, and valued. And when we can give and receive without judgment, which is one of the skill sets of empathy, that's when we can derive sustenance and strength from our relationships. And then we can look at empathy. I thought this was one of the most profound things for me when I started to look at unpacking empathy. I keep hearing everyone talk about empathy and it's not sympathy and what's compassion? How does that compare? So we actually look at her, looked at her research and worked with leadership teams to unpack what are these skill sets if we want to teach and build teach, 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 teach. with around empathy. And it boils down to, and there may be other different um, definitions, but we use the work of Brene Brown and it's perspective taking. It's staying out of judgment. And I would invite us to think about how we're also applying these for our self-compassion, ourselves, not just others, but recognizing emotions. Emotions are healthy. And sometimes it's hard to have emotions and know what to do with them, but recognizing those emotions within, our, within ourselves and others and communicating back to others, communicating to ourselves, what are those emotions, you know, how are they showing up, what are they saying to us. And so when we look at if we unpack around empathy, one of those skill sets was communication. And this is something that I keep seeing over and over, and that is that Yes, relationship is the foundation um, for healthy dialogue. So we're having a lot of difficult 
conversations and dialogue and education and in our culture and our country. And one of the things that keeps showing up for me is this notion of practicing communicating. And for me, it takes a lot of practice to have a healthy dose of what we call active listening to understand. Active listening is one of those practices that you can see throughout the research and literature as having an impact on our ability to communicate, to have empathy for one another. Because typically for me, I will just put myself out there. Um, when someone comes to me with a problem or something they wanna share to me, I had this, um, I'm a recovering um, people pleaser. And so I wanna like move right into problem solving. And what I'm learning for myself, my replacement behavior is, you know what? They might not want you to say anything. They may just want you to hold space and listen and use the skill sets that reflect back to that person that you're listening. And then maybe you might ask permission. Would you like me to offer you some considerations or what have you? But this is one of those things that we can do and start modeling for one another, starting with ourselves, that communicates to others, I see you, I know you, I love you, I hear you, right? Because if we can't hear people, then I can't see people, right? And so it seems simple, but it really is important. Um, and this perspective taking through communication, you're gonna hear um, Jessica get, tell some beautiful stories of how she just, she's gifted. I, I've, I've, I've had the, the opportunity to go into schools with her and even just to observe her ability to connect and take perspective with others is, I know it's changing my biology just to watch her in action, but she's gonna share stories that just, she automatically goes to that. She's moved away from that kind of old way of thinking like here's, you know, just do this. It's not that, she invites people in um, to be part of the solution. And I just think it's brilliant, um, the work that she's done and Rachel has done too as a student leader. So there are skill sets there, I'll just, I won't go through these, but you can see how you can start to unpack some of these um, concepts, these values, these ideas around, and we can look at operationally defining these so that we can start to have awareness, like what does it really mean to have empathy, to give and receive that, and can we build skill sets around that? So I think I'm going to stop here. Um, but before I, we're going to transition. So as we transition so that um, Jessica and Rachel can share their screen, I just want to invite you, if you have a sheet of paper, to take some notes and perhaps listen to the stories, listen to these experiences. And on a sheet of paper, maybe you've got your circles reflected, you know, data, practices, and systems. And maybe you've got um, school community, staff, students, families and listen for ways in which you can start to populate, hmm, how are we using data to know if people are connected to school, to know if people feel like they belong? What are the practices you hear reflected in the stories that were going to be shared? And what are some of the systems that are in place to cultivate um, these intentional relationship building skills? So I'll let you take a picture or jot down your notes and I'm gonna stop sharing while you do that. And I'm going to ask Jessica and Rachel to start sharing. Hello, everybody. I hope you guys are having a great day. Give us just a sec to get us going with their presentation. Um, before I do my introduction, I feel blessed to have Rachel here with me, and I'm going to let her present in just a sec. Um, but I'm the assistant superintendent in Roanoke County Schools in Virginia. And one of the pieces that we've learned through this whole process is little steps along the way. Baby steps make big outcomes. And even in a conversation right before this conference started, um, Rachel said, you're never gonna believe this happened. And this just kind of fell on my plate. So it's really the little things that keep moving us forward. It's, it's like the ripple effect. So with that, um, when Kim and Rachel and I started planning this, we really see the whole PBIS process as, as a tree. With PBIS at the foundation, it's the roots, it's what holds us together. It's, um, it's all we do and relationships are embedded throughout that bottom part. And that's the piece you know that holds the tree up. So once we start branching out, we start dealing with teacher relationships and connections and student relationships and student and teacher relationships and families and teams and community partnerships. And once, you if I can't instill anything in you today, except for the fact 
just keep moving forward and just be open to ideas. We, um, we are learning as we go, but um, with that, I want Rachel to kind of outline her story with the tree. So we're gonna switch seats because she's actually in my office. So here is Rachel Buffo Bonnie, and she is a student at one of our high schools. Hello, Hello everyone. Um, I want to thank Kim and Dr. McClung for um, working with me and allowing me to share my story and what I've been working on with Central and then also just my take on the past year and a half. So like Dr. McClung had said, PBIS is the foundation for the tree and I'll just be going through, I guess, each part of the tree and the different relationships and um, points that we have covered across the leaves. So to start with, we have the trunk, which is the connections and student relationships. So last year during my junior year, I decided to become an all online student. So essentially I didn't come into school at all. And I took all of my classes and courses via a Blackboard, which is an education website. So um, I feel as though for any educators who are acquaintanced or are knowledgeable about second education, in terms of high school years, I would say that junior year is just typically the hardest in terms of schooling and then also extracurriculars and getting ready for college. So during that time with being all online and being isolated from teachers that I had previously gained relationships or had strengthened relationships from my previous two years, I found that it was a little bit hard and I did feel very isolated during that time. And of course I had friends, but it wasn't the same as you know, going into school and actually being able to interact with them and then also teachers as well. So during the first quarter of our school year, halfway through, I decided to reach out to my sophomore English teacher who last year had this thing in her class in the beginning of every single session where we would share our roses and thorns for the week. So essentially the roses would be the sort of like happy, positive things that we'd be looking forward to for the rest of the day or the rest of the week. And then the thorns were things that maybe weren't going so well in our lives or things that we weren't looking forward to. But um, just knowing that I had the possibility or the ability to reach out to this or an English teacher um, made this time feel a lot better, or at least I felt a lot more connected to the school. Um, I feel as though her initially going out of her way to make that connection with not only me, but with all of her classes was really important. And it made me feel as though I had someone at my school to connect to and to reach out to if I needed help. So after the trunk, we have the branches, which is families and teams. So starting around eighth grade, I was actually nominated by my middle school to be a part of a student advisory council that we have here up at central office, where essentially students from all of the middle schools and high schools come together. And we sort of serve as the um, intermediary or the middle person between the respective student bodies at our schools and then the school board. So through this group, we've been able to do amazing things such as um, change our dress code. I think it was actually my first year we were, we were able to change our dress code and we actually made national news, which is really awesome, as well as help host um, uh, volunteering events in our community as well. And each year we host these um, springtime leadership conferences where we nominate around three to five students from each grade. So starting from eighth grade on to senior year where we just come and we let them participate in workshops that sort of detail different um, areas of leadership. So in previous years, we've had people from the community like um, we've had a Chick-fil-A manager at one of the major Chick-fil-A's that we have in the area. And he talks and gives his story and sort of how he got into servant leadership. And then we've had um, previous uh, members or workshops sort of detailing other sorts of, or other types of leaderships in fields such as medicine and also engineering as well. So that's been awesome. Um, so through that group, I was actually able to connect with Dr. McClung and start the student equity team. So last year, um, during one of the meetings for the Student Advisory Council, Dr. McClung and Mrs. Wimbush, who was the equity director for Roanoke County, came into one of our meetings and shared with us the equity task force that they started the previous year. Um, 
at least for the objective for this equity task force, it would be to promote inclusion and diversity throughout the whole entire schools, with the focus primarily being on staff and administrators. So I thought that this would be something very cool to be a part of, at least you know, providing a student voice that way they have input from the people that they're serving. And I was the, or I am currently still the youth representative for this group as well. So the year goes on, it's around March and I'm thinking, I, I really enjoy the concept or at least the ideas that the group has. If we were to able to sort of bridge that or make a task force or a task team, but sort of geared towards students in the student body. So around March, I proposed to Dr. McClung and I was like, hey, maybe we should go ahead. I'd be willing to help run and start up a student equity team, which promotes um, diversity and inclusion throughout not only, I guess, the staff, but then primarily the students throughout all of the high schools and middle schools as well. So from branches, we have leaves. So starting around June, we had a major meeting or we were having about like twice a month, three meetings per month, just sort of planning out our plans for this year. And throughout our whole entire planning sessions, we were throwing ideas, throwing out groups of people that we knew or organizations within our community that would want to work with us. And the first group that uh, we suggested and have been working with as of right now is Points of Diversity which is a local nonprofit that's been promoting diversity and inclusion discussions throughout schools since around 2013, 2014. Um, so with this group, like Dr. McClung had said, we're actually um, sending over student volunteers for a cultural fest that we're having the beginning of November. So through community partnerships, we're able to not only um, advance the goals, that we want for our group as well, but we've been able to not only take people from our student group, but um, other volunteer groups and student groups within each of the schools as well to come and help with this effort too. Um, another huge exciting thing that we've been able to do is to help um, coordinate a college visit. So around September, I reached out to um, Miss Karen Ellie Sanders, who is the equity and diversity director over at Virginia Tech. And I proposed, or I didn't propose, but I sort of told her what we were doing over at Roanoke County, showed her the agenda, all of the plans that we had organized. And she was really excited and very enthusiastic and offered a spring campus visit for marginalized students or marginalized high schoolers throughout our whole entire school district, which is really awesome. So just recently, Dr. McClung and Mrs. Wimbush met with her. And not only are we going to be doing this visit in March, but we're also going to have workshops leading up to it. So our first workshop is actually starting November. So as you can see, the, with the whole ripple effect, the ripple stage, we were able to take that one awesome opportunity and sort of blow it up and then allow more people than just my group to take a part of it as well. Um, uh, concerning the local prevention councils, at the end of the year, we do have plans to partner with um, one of our county district uh, community groups to sort of talk about a range of topics concerning equity. So that's where students from my group, as well as other students who are interested in coming, will help moderate and host these conversations. So these conversations will be held in each of the five regions within our district too. So again, as you can see, each stage acted as a ripple to the next. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be willing to take them now. Rachel, no one had any questions, but lots of positive comments on a job well done. Thank you. So I would keep Rachel in here, but our adult equity team actually has a meeting. And so Rachel's going to step out to go to another meeting. Um, I can tell you um, she is self-motivated, but every one of your divisions has a Rachel. You all all have the best resource you can tap into, which is our students. And all this was was one conversation leading to something else, leading to something else and making a change for everybody. So thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate you more than you know. 
Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about our school division. So um, one of the pieces we're in Roanoke, Virginia, we're known as the star city. And from the slide, you can see that we have a big star that lights up. You can actually go up there, overlook the city. Um, kids like going up there, but that's never a good idea. Um, and then it overlooks our city, which we think is a big city. Some of you all might not. And we're surrounded by the gorgeous Blue Ridge Mountains. So we're really, we kind of have the best of both worlds. We have a little city, little, little, little woods and um, hiking trails around. So um, in our division, we have something called our sea change framework. And this is something our superintendent really values. And, and at the core of that is, is deeper learning. And then we've got all the C's that we are all familiar with. But what I'm so proud of with him is um, the focus of our whole division is learning culture, balance, school climate, professional growth, and support services. And if that doesn't have PBIS written all over it, nothing does. Um, so in our division, we know we all come from different backgrounds, and we all want our kids and staff to feel safe and secure in our schools. And I'm not talking just with school safety. I'm talking safe emotionally. And we also want to create an environment that supports all of our students and staff. And what we've really learned is it's really just all about relationships. I love that Rachel told the story of a previous teacher because she didn't tell about how well the teacher taught or what skill set she had to bring to the table. She talked about getting to know the kids and trying to, to understand them, build those relationships. And I truly believe that once you have that, um, you can, can make such great progress. So. I'm going to share just some stories because um, I don't have a magic wand. I'd like to say I do, but I don't. But what I do know is I have some interesting experiences. So um, probably we're not alone, but um, this past maybe July and August, that's when everything got heated about, do we wear masks? Do we not wear masks? There were a group of people that believe that um, not wearing masks is bad, 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 and the other group that feel masks are making kids sick and we can't breathe. So our community was no different than yours. Um, we had a lot, a lot of strong emotions. And of course, just like I've seen on the um, national and local news, people flood the school board meetings to um, share their stories. So um, we, about a week before school started, we had a public hearing um, at our school board, and we had some protesters outside. And then um, inside, several people stood up to speak pro and against masking. So one of the students that is, I'm gonna share a video clip with, um, she and her siblings had a really tough time with masks the first year we had um, more virtual learning. We didn't have all virtual, we never went all virtual, but um, our secondary students, for most of the year were in two days a week and then three days a week online. And so she and her siblings really struggled. And when their mom who reached out to me, who let me just say also happens to be my neighbor across the street. So if that doesn't put a little stress in your job, nothing will. So um, she had sent me some emails and some of the examples that she had used where her kids felt somewhat shamed for um, taking mass breaks the year before. She said, um, one of her kids said the class was told that if they didn't keep their masks on while they were riding the bus, they were gonna be kicked off and they couldn't ride the bus anymore. The bus driver said if they were caught with their mask down under their nose, which I don't know if you've been into a school recently, but that's probably the biggest issue, it's under the nose, that they would be punished and have to sit up front with the driver. Um, one of the um, students in this family said that the teacher told the kids in um, the classroom that they needed to participate in positive peer pressure uh, and start telling their classmates who weren't wearing their masks properly to fix it. And she also went and said that they would be the reason students would have to go home and quarantine. And then um, the student also had a friend who yelled at her because um, our friend was yelled at because he had taken a break in class. He had pulled his mask under his nose and the kid, the student's words were he flipped out and said they were not allowed to pull them down. If you had a problem with it, they could go see the principal. And so um, I really feel like in this time, we have such strong emotions. The political climate is, is so challenging. And so my neighbor across the street stood up to speak at our board meeting. And I'd like for you, this is just a couple minutes, but I'd like for you to hear how emotional um, she is, and I'm going to share with you what we did to handle that. So bear with me while I try to get us into the right link to see the video. Okay. 
think it matters how many times you practice this. It's always sorry. Okay. One sec. My share button is completely gone. That's not helpful. Kim, can you thumb me up if you can see? Yeah, I'm seeing the PowerPoint and maybe if you um, hit your mouse, click on, yeah, um, there you go. Is it there now? Um, it might be loading up. It looks like uh, there's a blank screen with Roanoke County School Board meeting. Hold on one sec, I'm so sorry. My actual Zoom has completely. No worries. I'm sorry, give me one sec. Can you see that, Kim? Um, I don't see a picture. I'm Jennifer, sorry. I'm wondering, um, have, let's see. Actually, my whole screen has um, decided to take a rest. Well, it's late in the afternoon on the East Coast, so I feel okay. the same. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give it one more shot. So okay. you can always tell us how that went too. Um, if you hit Escape to exit full screen, perhaps if that would help. I just see that prompt on your screen. Press my, Escape at the very top. Are actually gone. Okay. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to share. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about what she said. She was highly emotional um, when she started speaking. She um, she said that she could not breathe wearing a mask last year. She felt um, singled out and bullied, um, and she was was really really uncomfortable. And so with that, she was in in tears and really did not know how to handle the situation. So I am going to, and I completely apologize. I have no idea why this has done this, but I'm going to try again with and try to just get back to the PowerPoint because it's clearly being hateful, which is fine. Kim, I'm wondering if my computer's completely at a blank. Do you want me to share my screen? Can you share, do you have your slides? Yes, if you can share yours, that will work for me. Okay. And while you're doing that, I'll, I apologize. No worries. So uh, Jessica, I'll put the, um, we might just want to remind people, they should be able to see the video in your PowerPoint that you uploaded, right? Yes, and I'll, I'll make sure I'll make sure it's in there. Um, sure. So one of the things I did when this happened, because it was so emotional after she spoke, her parents both spoke, there were tears. Then we had another group that spoke about wearing the masks. And so unfortunately, when our governor finally made the decision that we were going to be under a mask mandate, the mask mandate was to begin on the first day of our school year. We start a little bit earlier than some other divisions. So. Um, instead of just referring to the public health order, um, we really wanted to focus on relationships. And I, and I was a little bit stressed when I called Kim originally because we had so little time. And, um, and although I was trying to think outside of the box and come up with creative ideas, I said, why am I doing that? Let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to our matrix because our kids are all familiar with the matrix. And let's try to do a matrix for mask wearing. But I didn't have time. I had so little time. And so what I did was I walked across the street. Thankfully, they did live across the street for me. Walked across the street. I shared a draft of a matrix with the parent, with the student. I wanted the student to be heard, even though we did have at that point now a, an order from the governor that said we would do masks. And then after I got their input, which was so important, I reached out to some coaches, principals, a couple nurses, some teachers, and just other kids in my neighborhood, whoever I could find in that limited amount of time. And from that, we did create a mask matrix. And in that, our family, actually, some of what they put in the matrix, um, and I know it's small on your screen, but I did upload a copy in the file section 
um, of the PBIS forum site. So you could see it in larger font and you can welcome to take it, steal it, use it if you can. But the family was really concerned about, you know, can they get fresh air? And what are some things that we can do to make sure our kids um, get enough sleep and stay active and focus on the wellness piece? So we created a matrix and then we taught it and we lived by it. And it was that simple. And from then I have had some communication of course, with the parent throughout the year. And there were some bumps in the road at the beginning, but what made my life so much easier was the fact that we had created this matrix. I'd sent it out to principals, they shared it with staff. And anytime somebody called me and they were upset about having to wear the mask and I said, let me show you this document. This is what we're telling teachers. This is how we're guiding teachers to interact with your, your kiddos. None of us like wearing masks, but we're gonna make sure we accommodate for you. We come up with safe spaces for non-masks. Use. We're going to make sure our kiddos get to eat and they're spread out and they don't wear a mask. And so we made it more comfortable. And this kind of took the heat off of principals and teachers when they were dealing with opposite polar sides of that spectrum. So it was extremely helpful. And that just like um, some of you all did, I'm sure is also what we did when we went into some remote learning last year, we made sure that all of our matrices were revamped for what do we do when we're virtual? What do we do with technology? What do we do with work packets? What do we need to do when we're upset or stressed? Um, all of that. We just keep going back to our matrix. We're not coming up with anything sh bright and shiny. We're just referring right back to what we know and tweaking it as we need to tweak. So um, sometimes in this work, we have to rebuild relationships. So if you guys can. Okay, so I'm going to share with you about um, one of our, um, Rachel mentioned our direct, director of equity. Her title is actually, actually director of equity and engagement. And the reason we wanted to do that was so we could focus on relationships. And when we started with our equity work in our division, there was this one principal that I really had a beef with. And she had a beef with me. We didn't have a trust. We had dealt with the situation several years back um, and we had very different perspectives. So we were two people, different backgrounds, different experiences. We had one situation with two different perspectives. And then we had three years where we did not work together. We, we were friendly and civil, of course, because that's who we are, but we never would volunteer to work together. And we certainly didn't have a relationship. So um, two years ago, she called me on the phone one day and she said, I just have to tell you, when we had that meeting, you made a comment and it brought up a lot of conflict for me because she is um, a, a woman of color. And I had made a comment. I could tell she was upset with me in a meeting. And I said, it seems like you're so angry. And, and she goes, I felt racial tension with that. She said, I was always brought up not to be the angry black woman. And I said, I never, ever would have wanted to say something to make you feel uncomfortable. So at the beginning of this conversation, it was very uncomfortable, but we knew our minds were in the right place with PBIS and with equity and with the work we needed to do. And if we couldn't trust each other, we could not move forward. So we spent about two hours on the phone learning from each other. And from that, we've been able to grow that relationship in order to make a difference with our kids. So here's one example. One example, <clears throat> um, Last year, we had a student who used a racial slur um, toward another student, and this was on social media, of course, um, the devil for, for all of us, I would say. So um, we had a parent who contacted us and said this had happened. And so um, the parent naturally was extremely upset. Um, and this was a student of color who had received the racial slur. So um, Lori, the director of equity and I went together to the school and we met with the student who had received the negative comment. And we also met with the student who had given the negative comment. And I think this is important for us because we have to start talking and trying to figure out why would anybody think that's okay? Instead of immediately going from A to Z, suspending the kid, of course there are consequences when you do something wrong in school, but we needed to understand why. Um, and when we spoke with the student who sent this derogatory comment over social media, what he shared with us, because we had that honest, hard conversation, was that um, he happened to be a biracial student. And he said, you know, I don't feel like I fit in with any group. 
And so the word he used, he said a lot of his friends use that word, but it's different for them. And so when we talked to him, we, you know, we started clicking and we started thinking, oh my gosh, our school climate survey also showed some information that was inappropriate and not inappropriate, but out of skew. So let me share with you how that worked out. So when we did this and talking to the student, now I have a trust with this director of equity and engagement. Um, we're making some change. We're building these relationships with the kiddos and we know we want um, to grow our own teachers. So, and, and this is gonna seem a little off and I'll show you how it connects. Our direct, director of equity is working on her doctorate at a local university. In her programming, there happens to be a teacher that she's had that she's built the relationship with and her son is biracial and goes to another college somewhere else in Virginia. So from those connections, um, we actually connected with her son, her biracial son who had gone to a very rural school with not a lot of diversity. And we reached out to him, had a phone call one evening and he agreed to mentor some of our biracial students who don't feel as connected as some of our other populations. So from that, we also were able to follow up with the parent. Everybody was happy with the outcome because of that collaboration. And it all happened to do with an intertwining of relationships. So we went back and looked at our data. And from this, this is from our school climate survey. You can see pretty clearly on this chart, our biracial students did not feel as connected. And this just happens to be a random school in our division. This was um, an elementary school. And so we looked at some middle school examples and yep, we've got the same thing. We have biracial students who did not feel as connected as our Hispanic students or our white students. And so then we also looked at a high school example and we had the same data. So we knew there was a problem division wide and we knew we had to change it. And the way we felt we could best meet their needs would be to change that by, by building those relationships. And so that's where we are now. Now we're working on our groups to, to, to have our, our student at a college mentor our students. So that's how it works. There are no magic wands, but one thing leads to another. And, and if people can just keep the open mind when we're working with students who have these challenging situations, everything's heated at my level. No, nobody really calls to say, can you come to this meeting? It's going to be a great time. We're going to, we're going to bond and sing Kumbaya and have coffee. That doesn't happen. I get invited to the, to the, to the harder meetings. So the only way I found that works is, is to try to connect with people and to try to be honest with people and to say what you mean and mean what you say. So here's another example that we had this year. Um, the picture you see these are two classrooms, one's a math class, one's an English class, and for Black History Month last year, um, the two, well, there are actually three teachers. There's a co-teaching team in one room and then one gen ed teacher in the other. So this was their door decoration for Black History Month, and that was last February. So after the, the contest ends for the door decorating, the principal has them take down the decorations because um, in our safety plans, you can't block the windows of the door. We need to be able to have access and be able to see what's happening in the room. So the teachers um, took down the decorations, but this is what their classrooms look like now on the inside um, because they spent a lot of time on these decorations and they're, they're great decorations. So um, one class has the male face and the other has the female face. And you can see they both have rainbow flags, um, different flags to symbolize a safe environment for their kids. And um, these are seventh grade classrooms. And the teachers, I cannot stress this enough, these are great teachers for building relationships with kids. So in fact, they built such good relationships that an eighth grader this year who has a transgender plan in our division list these teachers as his support person in that school because he knows they understand and they accept. And so the relationships carry on beyond their grade level. So um, the principal receives a, a couple phone calls from a parent and the parent's very upset. And the parent's upset that we're teaching critical race theory and he's upset that the Black Lives Matter um, letters are, are on this face. And um, he was, was very, um, a very challenging parent. And our principal really just didn't know how to handle it because he knows 
these teachers build these relationships. He knows this is the safe, safe space his kids need. And so um, he called and I said, well, let's just go out there. You know, we're going to go out there and see what's going on. So now we'd already had this other issue. So we looked at our school climate survey again, because um, the flags in our classroom have been controversial for the past several years. So we did look at our information from our school climate survey, and we know that our kids associating as LGBTQ plus are not feeling as connected as our heterosexual kids. And we have that, that's a middle school example for you all. Um, and then there's a high school example of orientation. So we see this is division wide at every single school almost, we see the same data. So we know there's a problem. So in the past, Previously, here's how we think differently then and now. Previously, we would have had the teachers just take down their stuff from their classroom because we don't want to offend people and, and we all want to be kind and get along. But that's really not how we work now because now we've got to talk the talk and we've got to walk the walk. So what that meant is Lori and I dropped what we were doing here at our office and we went out to the school that day because the teachers were upset. And the teachers were really doubly mad because the principal would not tell them who made the complaint. And um, he did that purposefully because he did not want the teachers to be tainted in any way against the child because the child isn't the one who has the problem. The dad has the problem. So we went out to the school, we visited the classrooms, we talked to the teachers and we did this without the principal because we know he's supporting his teachers. He's just not sure how to do that in a way that doesn't create um, problems, more problems. So um, we processed everything. We played devil's advocate. We had honest conversation and it wasn't easy conversation. Um, the, at the first day we met, emotions were high. The teachers were like, you know, our school division is not diverse enough. We're going to go somewhere else. And I said, you can't go anywhere else. We have kids that need you here. So we didn't make any decision then. We said, listen, we've had some great conversations. Let's process this. And, and this was say a Thursday. So let's come back next Tuesday. And, and let's let's go over all of these examples and scenarios that we've had today and process it again. And that's a lot of time to take out of our office because we're all busy. And yes, this year is chaotic, but it needed to happen. So when we went back, um, there were tons more questions, even more conversation. And in this meeting, the principal joins in. And so um, and you can flip the slide. Um, the principal joins in and he explains to the teachers why he did not share the name of the person who made the comment. And at this school, they're a tier two school right now in our implementation process. And um, they now value more collaboration and relationships than they've ever done in the past. So we were able to have those conversations. And because of the trust that we had built up, it not only changed the process at this school, but it changed the process at all schools because what happened um, the teachers posed a solution. They, they said, you know, we, we, we started talking again. It was a great conversation. They said, we figured this out. What the parent didn't like was the BLM lettering. And, and the teacher said, I, I said, none of your stuff is, is, is offensive to anyone but this parent. So what they said they wanted to do is they said, listen, our, some things that are our personal beliefs with groups, we're going to put on our desk. And other things we're going to keep on the wall. So they kept the flags on the walls, but they said instead of they had taken wording and said all Northside students matter. And that was the name of their school. And they put that on there with some of the other things that made kids feel safe in their classroom. And they they problem solved that. And I was like, that's great. If, if that works for you, that's great. We're not gonna make you take it down, but is there a happy medium? And so they posed the, the solution and it was a win-win for everything. So I had a lot of discussions with our superintendent um, about that. And I said, instead of making rash decisions, what we've got to do is take everything on a case-by-case -case basis. Let's evaluate it, let's talk through it, let's start having conversations because if we don't do that, we're gonna dig our heels in and let our emotions stall the progress we're making. So um, it really has changed the way we're working with individual people who complain because you all probably have just as much complaining as we have in our world. So um, with that, I wanna talk to you now about um, the importance of student voice. One of the things that we have learned as we've gone along in this process is how important it is to get input from our students. And so when we first started working with student voice, 
um, and you can flip the slide. We have several focus areas for PBIS in our division. Of course, we have the social emotional learning, we have trauma, we have school safety, signs of suicide is, is a big piece for us and equity and diversity and substance abuse. And this example is about suicide because when we first initiated our signs of suicide program, we tried to brainstorm where do we find that happy balance of, of, of working with suicide prevention. And we decided to start with eighth grade. And the year we started this, we had a seventh grader at one of our middle schools who committed suicide. And so um, it's concerning that we have students and we, you know, we have had our fair share of students who have committed suicide. So this was very important to us. So the first activity we did is called responding to the data. And we pulled our kids in, we started with middle school and high school. We pulled groups of kids and we, we made sure it was diverse groups of kids. We wanted every grade level. We wanted um, different ethnic groups. We wanted LGBTQ representation. We wanted kids who were academically good, kids who struggled, kids who had behavior problems, kids who didn't. So, and we didn't let the principals pick because it's not a showcase. We want, we wanted some of our counselors who really knew the kids to pick, pick these, these students. So we got together and we, um, every year our state has us com um, complete a school climate survey. Our students do the survey and our teachers do the survey. And then they post the results on a website at the state level. And I don't know that people read that. Every kid I've ever asked, I've said, hey, did you see your school climate survey and what your responses were? Nope, they didn't. Um, so what I've learned is anytime we ask kids to do something like a, a survey, we've got to share that with them and let them process it too. So what we did at this meeting, we looked at our state climate survey and the students looked and they identified what they were most proud of, what concerns they had. And what was really cool was they could look to see how teachers rated the same questions to see if teachers' comments and the student comments were in line, which was quite funny because they weren't. Um, so here are a couple of examples. Um, and I love the, the concern, right? You can see suicide is prevalent in almost all of these. Suic our suicide rate at, at this particular school was higher than state average. And the gaps between <laughs> teachers and students, the students say they actually like school and the students say they finish their homework. Now, I don't know if they always get it turned in, but they do believe they finish their homework. Um, and, and it was interesting the, the kids said, we're never gonna tell our teachers we like school, but, but we really do. And they also said, our teachers don't have to have a dog and pony show. Um, we, we, know, we know that they like us and we know that, you know, when they connect with us, we get it. They don't need to do elaborate lessons, you know, anything like that. We just know. So um, the next slide says most concerning. They also identified issues such as self-harm, kids who have been harmed in the home. They just didn't realize this. Um, there were about 20% of the kids at the school who had considered suicide in the past year. That's a huge number. Um, the word suicide and drugs on the next slide um, just are identified by a middle school group that that was their concern. And then um, on another group, they, what concerns you most, 25% of students had, had considered suicide. That is extremely disturbing for our kids. So I'm going to pray that possibly my computer has um, given me a little blessing and let's start the video. I I think I can play. Is this the one, Jess? Yes. Okay, I just think have I can play right there. Yes. Same question. What's most surprising? Um, the fact that fourteen point nine percent of students said that they've been forced into sexual uh, intercourse is one of the things. That's right. What makes that surprising? Um, we don't typically hear about it um, at our school that much, and it's a horrific thing that yeah. many people don't feel that they can speak out against because they feel like vulnerable and they don't feel they have like the voice to speak out against it. All right, same question again. What's the most surprising so far? Um, that the abuse rate went up at home. Okay, what about, tell me what's surprising about that? Because like, you don't think like a parent could do that to their child. And like, people don't talk about it because it's like sensitive to them and stuff. I know that I didn't get an Instagram. All right, so same question again. What's most surprising so far? Um, I've already said mine. 
Did we say this one last time, the weapons? Did we say that last time? I don't think we did. Um, just that bird. Oh, we thought it was really good that, let's see, what was the, when there's a higher percentage of kids that are spending more time going outside, working out, doing physical fitness more than there used to be. What uh, over here? What set you guys use friends? What's surprising in this this particular set of data? Um, there's a big one there's between 2016 and 2018, 60 percent increase in 13 year olds and under using social media. What, what is That's just like a really large platform of strangers that kids are being introduced to. And it's getting younger and younger. Yeah, like I feel like they're not ready. Like they shouldn't be put in that position. Like especially all the stuff that goes on. There's so many like influencers in today's society that are just negative for younger students and it's really like showing in and today's society yeah it's really addictive too and if you like start younger it's gonna be more yeah and they think yeah. it's cool to act like that too like yeah. they think it's cool to like do they're gonna bad start stuff acting and, like that of the things they see yeah, yeah and that's just how they they're influenced by these people who are way older like, making dumb decisions really sending a positive message um, I would ask if you, we can do the same circle and share. I think you wanted me to stop there, Jess. You're, you're muted. I feel like it's that scene from the movie, nobody puts baby in a corner because you're muted, Jess. <laughs> and I was hoping that you would unmute so you could pick up here with what you want. Can you to hear do. me now, Kim? I can hear you now. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I don't have any of my, um, my buttons to push. So, okay, sure. so whoever's rolling my PowerPoint, could you roll just a little bit more? Do you want me to continue with the video or go to the next slide? No, to the next slide. Okay. So um, one of the pieces that we did after we started working with the secondary students, we did expand into elementary and Tina Turner, the, the real Tina Turner who works here, she actually has gone with me into multiple schools and, and we wondered if we would get the same results from building those relationships with the younger students. And what we found was we did. Um, students, we started with third through fifth grade, we were a little nervous. Um, and Tina and I were both secondary teachers and administrators, not elementary. But what we found is our elementary students were just as profound as our secondary students. Um, one thing we know is they all want swings on a playground, but evidently that's bad because of broken limbs. But they also wanted to do things like recycle. And we had a, a second grader who, who clearly was a little bit hyper who said, I think that we should all be our teacher's favorites. I don't think um, teachers should pick favorites. And, and our kids could articulate that they indeed knew who, who the favorites were. So once we establish those relationships with the kids, we'll start work in a school and then the schools pick it up and take it from there because they see the value of having those relationships with the kids. So again, it doesn't matter how slowly you go as long as you just don't stop. Um, so Kim, if you will forward to the next, and I am praying that the next where it says thank you would run the video. It should be a right mouse click on the thank you. 
Um, I would love to share it, but I don't have the privilege to share it. <laughs> it says telling me my access is denied. Do you want to try to share your screen again and see what happens if you bring it up? I will try again. And I, I fully apologize to, to you all who don't even don't even. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm not sure why my screen is gone. However, um, it is not letting me, it is not letting me. Okay. Um, so I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, but I will go back and post some of the videos so you guys can watch. Um, the, the real focus is, is just the relationship building and, um, and one little piece has led to so many other, other things that we're doing here. So again, I apologize for the glitch in the program, but, um, I'm welcome, you know, for any questions. I don't know if Tina, you have any questions that you could read. You ladies have done such a wonderful job. There's absolutely no questions whatsoever. Just lots of wonderful comments. Okay. Okay. All right. Kim, any other last minute parting thoughts? Well, I'm going to have to share my screen in a moment for the evaluation slide. So while I'm doing that, though, I would love to hear um, in the chat as people are looking at the evaluation slide, um, were there specific examples I was taking mental notes when I was listening to the stories of specific examples of, you know, how we unpacked some of those skill sets that um, I heard in the stories that were shared. But I would just be curious to know if you heard those examples and or if you have examples that maybe you're like, oh, we did this and that really is building perspective taking or whatever the skill sets for relationship building that you've been working on as well. So if you wanna use the Pathable chat to do that, also here is the evaluation um, QRC for this session. I don't know, Tina, if you can put the link to that in the chat. If not, I'll leave this up for a moment. I do not have a link to that. Okay. I'll leave it up for a moment. It's also in the files if you want to just open up the file. We um, do have a question. It says, what were the next steps after you have students analyze the school climate data? Was there action taken? What ideas did student put forth to support other students who experience abuse? Okay, so for the for the abuse part, um, we're reporting that we're doing. Um, we opened up, we have, I don't, it's the, whatever technology system we use, anytime students email now or send anything with a threatening word in it, I get alerted to that. So if they talk about, um, let's say they're doing an assignment or they are silly enough to chat their friends from school, we get automatic alerts and it goes, those for the whole division go to me, the other assistant superintendent and one of our technology folks. So we are able to intercept a lot of that ahead of time now. Uh, and we've intercepted many, many, I would say almost daily, um, kids are talking about suicide. So we're able, they flag immediately. And um, if they're at a serious level, the company actually will call down the line until they get someone. And if they don't get us, they'll call the police. So that's been helpful. We talked to them about the need to report. One of the things we found, um, was that kids don't take it seriously. So many kids say, oh, I'm going to commit suicide. They just don't take it seriously. And so um, even if it's not suicide, if it's bullying, if it's anything, they've got to report it so we can, can work with that. So we, we outlined with them, you know, what social services does, if kids are not safe and, and just not shaming kids so they're able to talk. Um, for the um, biracial piece, of course, we took that back and are starting our mentoring program with that and doing more work um, with equity in our division. And then, um, Tina, was there another comment about climate data? No, the only thing that extra was added was what I did does student put forth to support other students who experience abuse? Say that again, do students? What ideas 
did the students put forth to support other students who experience abuse? Well, what they actually talked about was they didn't realize that many kids were, were being abused. They, they had no idea that shocked them. Um, they, in that same, that same day, they talked about the stress that they feel in classes. A little girl talked uh, at a table. She goes, you know, people who teach these advanced classes, they don't realize how much stress we have on us. And, and she was just deflated because of how hard it was. But they, they honestly had no idea that many students reported abuse. So, so they were just overwhelmed. And then one of the students also said, you know, we have about 25 or we have about 25 kids in this room. She goes, that would be like five of us wanting to commit suicide. And so, you know, they, they just didn't, they didn't really know how to process that. So we shared some things that we have in place, but, but we've also got, got to teach them not to make fun of kids, not to, not to bully. I mean, that goes hand in hand with all of our big pieces with DBIS in our division. Um, we're, we're taking it a step at a time, but we're not letting it go. If we did a bullying prevention program this year, we don't do it this year and then forget it. We go back and reteach it. And any of our initiatives that we do with social emotional learning, um, our school counseling team, they will train all staff, not just, they train everybody, all the staff. They start with the principals at, at their administrative retreat in the summer. They go to every teacher, then they train every student then we do community meetings so parents are hearing the same message. And then they implement groups, they collect data, and then they share out that data. And then we go back the next year and we do um, boosters. We're, we're, we're not forgetting our bullying program. We're not forgetting our signs of suicide. We still have all of those things in place, but it's not one and done. It, we continue with it. Any others, Tina? That's all. Again, I apologize about the technology. I, I hate that, but I will go back and, and upload some things onto the main main page if you guys want to watch later. I don't think anybody's worried about technology, Dr. McCon. I just see themes um, just applauding your your courage and your ability to think differently. You know, I just really appreciate you sharing things. So, um, you know, we all deal with hard stuff. Technically. We're exactly. all dealing with hard stuff and, and trying to deal with it without emotion, but the connectedness and, and, and just like Kim was talking with the relationships and the empathy piece, just, just to try to understand the perspective taking has been huge. Um, with the equity director that, that I'm working with now, she sees things way differently than I see things. We go into the same meeting and she comes out saying, oh, everybody's happy. I'm like, no, they weren't, they were mad. But it's it's so good to have the different perspectives. And so not letting pride overtake with what we're doing, just to sit back and know it's okay to go slow, but you're making a difference. Yeah. And there are lots of examples too, just really adding to the stories from other people's experiences and what I can see in the chat. I do have to give you a shout out. I got to give you a shout out. Someone just had a little nod to the Virginia accent. So go Virginia accent. <laughs> but thank you so much. I know you all have had a lot going on this school year in your district. And you just, you always show up with such grace and compassion. And I really appreciate you sharing today. It's, it's been lovely to hear you and Rachel share your story. So thank you.